Good morning, and welcome to St. Paul, United Church of Christ, Keokuk. Lord, let me hear it. You're still small. see you have a nice bright pants on today and you have a you have a, what are those galoshes is that an old did you ever hear that word before no boots <laughs> well it's the color, color of fire really and what we're talking about in the sermon today is a fire that can't be put out the fire of belief have you ever seen a fire that couldn't be put out you ever blow out birthday candles? Huh? <laughs> well, sometimes, sometimes people blow out birthday candles, but they have a trick pulled on them. And you know what the trick is? You're the only one up here, aren't you? Yeah. The trick is that, uh, that actually they have candles that, uh, that can't be put out. You'll blow on them, and then they'll go back, right, and, and uh, they'll have fire on them again. So when you believe in Jesus, it's like that. Nobody can put that out anymore. It just burns within you. Sometimes people refer to that as their heart is burning within them. Yeah, it's kind of like that. So when you believe in Jesus, uh, it really makes a big difference because that flame can't really be put out. Now, we have flames in some of the windows up there. Um, we have the burning uh, bush, and uh, we uh, also have the flame of the Spirit. You see over there? Because uh, the way we believe, sometimes it's compared to fire. Sometimes it's com compared to fire. So what I want you to say is burn, burn, burn. Burn, burn, burn. Very good. Believe, believe, believe. Okay, hold that. Put it up to your put it up to your mouth there. Yeah. No, your mouth. Go faith, faith, faith. faith, faith. Yes, very good. Uh-huh. Okay. All right, so when you think about the faith that you have, know that it can't be put out. And one of the reasons why it can't be put out is because there are all kinds of people who believe in it, too. It just spreads to people all the time. That's why we're here today. That's why we're here. All, a long time after Christ died and was rose to get, uh, rose, risen again. All right. Can you pray with me? All right. Lord, Lord. thank you. Thank for the, fire for the fire that can't be put out. That can't be put out. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. You did great. Sometimes when you're the only person up there, you're going, oh, wait a minute, you know. <clears throat> that was good. Okay. On this Transfiguration uh, Sunday, I'd like to think of the great things that God, that God does and, uh, and how in our faith a lot of things are compared to fire. Now, there are some fires that 
are hard to put out. For example, a fire on oil, if you put water on it, it just spreads all over the place. And there are some places where they mine coal where it turns out that uh, a fire starts underground. Well, you don't know where it spreads. You don't know where it's going to pop up next. And those fires, well, they burn for years. And you've got smoke coming up out of the ground for years. And our faith is kind of like that because it just spreads around like that. And the reason why you're here today, the reason why you're sitting in those pews today, is because the fire spread to you in Keokuk, Iowa. It spread all over the world within the hearts of believers. So it can't be put out because it's going to pop up somewhere else. Now, they tried to persecute Christians. They killed Christians. They tortured Christians to get them to renounce their faith. They boiled them in oil. They did all sorts of things. But nevertheless, the fire did not go out. There were still believers. There were some people, as a matter of fact, who believed even more because, you know, even more strongly because people were willing to die for their faith. This is a fire that can't be put out. It's kind of like those coal fires that just can't be put out because they're going to show up <clears throat> someplace else all the time. And they'll go underground all right, and sometimes Christians needed to go underground in order to hide. But they appeared then and continued to witness, so the faith passed from one generation to the other. I continually emphasize... <clears throat> oh, I put it out completely. Uh, <laughs> and I was just talking about a fire that wouldn't go out, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I continue to emphasize that uh, we are really making disciples. We're, we're keepers of the flame. We're, we're spreading that flame uh, wherever we go. People's hearts will burn within them with faith as we spread it. That's what the church does, as a matter of fact. And that fire is hard to put out as long as the church does what it's supposed to do, and that is to spread the faith around. Because the fires of Pentecost, you remember there was a great wind and it was as if there were tongues of flame on each person resting on their head. The fires of Pentecost need to spread. The way they spread is just the way the disciples actually spread it when uh, after Pentecost they went out and told the story of Jesus, how Jesus had come to save us. That's how the fire sustains itself. That's how it can't be put out. <clears throat> and one of the things, <clears throat> and I mentioned it before in relation to the church, that we need to learn in the modern age is that the church will not be populated so much by families having children within the church as it has in the past. Churches now need to witness. They need to spread that fire around within our society. We need to make disciples uh, out in society. And society is ripe for the picking in relation to that because making disciples for God is simply speaking to the needs of people out there. There is great need for a sense of peace these days. There is great need for a sense of love and compromise these days rather than shouting and arguing. Sometimes our society reminds me of a huge Jerry Springer show in which everyone is just yelling at one another, but uh, the spirit of compromise and love doesn't seem to be there as much as it used to be. Our society is very needy of that fire to be spread, and the church is very needy of learning how to spread it because for many, many years, we have just waited for people to have children, and then those children stayed in our town, and they attended our church, and we kind of forgot a little bit about what we needed to do, and that is to reach out 
and kindle the fire within the hearts of people who had all kinds of needs and were in all kinds of circumstances. The disciples went out and they kindled the fire wherever they could. And there were some things that were not so pleasant in relation to that. Sometimes they were run out of town. Because, for example, in one town, you had a kind of an industry going. I'll give you an example. They were making idols. What happens if you have believers who don't believe in idols? You can't sell as many idols. So they wanted to run the people out of town because they were cutting into the idol-making industry, is what it amounted to. So you see, when you have people in all kinds of circumstances and you have towns with all kinds of motives for possibly running you out of town, but nevertheless you speak. You still speak. You still try to find someone who may benefit from uh, the fire that you can light, the fire of belief that you can light within them. And one of the things that, that we do uh, as a church now is keep a list of people who may in some way or other benefit from hearing about that, that fire or, or may, may benefit in some way from the church that we've you know, found in the community and that sort of thing or someone has suggested that possibly it would be a good idea you know, that we talk to them uh, because they have various needs and so forth. So we have an active mission in relation to that. And it's important to keep an active mission so that that fire may spread. There is great power in the fire of belief. It is society changing. It is world changing. There is great power in that fire. And we read about it in the psalm. The mighty one, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. Our God is very powerful, and our God depends on us to be the voice which tells the world about that changing power which can change us for the good. We read, He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge the people. Gather to me my consecrated one who made a covenant with me by sacrifice, he says. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness. In God we see magnificent vitality and magnificent power. In God we see a certain magnificence which is really beyond our imagination but really, really impresses us. And we saw it in the transfiguration. It was so great, in fact, that the disciples wanted to uh, put up some booths in order to commemorate that. It was the power and majesty of God, the power and majesty of God that excites us. You see, excitement is important because... If we're excited about something, we're likely to do something about it. If we're excited about something, we're likely to do something about it. If we're excited about the Super Bowl, we're likely to watch the Super Bowl, right? And if we're excited by one team or the other, we're likely to cheer for that team, right? And if we're excited by maybe a business deal, we're likely to work on that. It depends on what excites us, and our faith can excite us greatly because within it is the power and majesty of God. The power and majesty of God by which God works wonders in the lives of people. I've seen God work great and wondrous things in people that I didn't really expect to see. So one person, for example, who was just really angry, and uh, was angry at everything and everybody. Well, that usually indicates that there's something else going on there, but he was angry at everything and everybody. And uh, came to church, uh, mainly because happened to be a a friend of mine, and as it turned out, was angry with the church. Well, he said, there was a bunch of hypocrites, of course, everybody knows that, 
And uh, of course, they fall short in various ways, you know, and protested and protested and pressed and protested and was very angry again. But one day he began asking questions about the scripture. And he began asking about what the scripture meant in certain places. And then he would criticize that. He would say, well, you know, I don't believe that stuff. You know, that's, that's just too good to be true. And then there's other stuff besides. But one thing you know as a minister, that if somebody is starting to protest like that, generally speaking, and asking questions, generally speaking, there's a little fire started there. There's a little kingdom going. The kindling is that in that person's needs. And as a matter of fact, when you see those first little flames, at first it's not a flame at all, it's just smoke. You see, just like, just like when you start a fire, it's mostly smoke at first until it gets hot. <clears throat> those were the questions, those were the blustering, those were, that was the anger and so forth. But the interest that he had, I knew that there was something going on there. And eventually it burst forth into full flame, his faith and belief. And he was happier. He was happier and filled with the power and majesty of God. I don't think the power and majesty of God can be seen in more fully than in a changed heart like that. Now, a lot of us would think, well, you know, this person is never going to respond. So why uh, continue to put effort in that direction? Well, sometimes we forget that uh, you're starting out with anger or whatever it might happen to be, and God has to change your heart, and it takes a little time. But when that heart is changed, it's a remarkable thing. I saw it in an addict once, and I, I attribute this to God, even though I really, I don't know whether he, he followed through with church or not, because I couldn't really say anything about it. I was a substance abuse counselor. But there's something in the big book that says, well, basically it says <clears throat> this one guy went to a doctor. He was having trouble with alcohol. He said, I can't control it, doc. And the doc says, well, that's unfortunate because you have a terminal disease. And uh, I've never really seen a lot of people who were able to overcome it. And he says, it's most likely, he said to him, it's most likely that you're going to die because you're going to drink yourself to death. But then the doctor says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, there's something spiritual that goes on in some people. And I, I have seen it, he said. All of a sudden, things will change, and there doesn't seem to be a real reason for it. It, it just seems to happen all of a sudden. Well, I myself, as a substance abuse counselor, thought, well, you know, it's possible that things could change like that, I suppose. But I've never, you know, I've, I saw that one guy who was angry and so forth, and his heart changed, but that was over time. But then it occurred in one group where someone who had all kinds of federal charges had lived a wild life and was a wild person. I mean, he would take advantage of anything for his own pleasure. All of a sudden, in group, and I, I can tell you the exact moment, he was talking about his family, and something changed. And he gave me a call every Christmas after that, saying that he was sober. And his life had completely changed around. Now, I am filled with wonder at that. That is a marvelous thing. How in the world... Does someone's whole life change around in just a moment? It would be like all of a sudden I didn't want chocolate anymore. What would that be like? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it's the power of God. The power and majesty of God which changes everything. You can take the Apostle Paul too. He was busy persecuting Christians. And the, and the fire of that change is a symbol of change and purification. You know, all of a sudden things change, and all of a sudden there's purification. 
Paul was busy <clears throat> persecuting Christians, and he was breathing anger against them, just like that one angry guy that I was talking about. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> all of a sudden on the road, he saw a vision of Jesus, and he was completely changed. He was completely changed. By what power does that occur? By what power does that occur? We have our habits, and they're so hard to break. Don't we go back into them all the time? How is it that somebody can change to such a degree that all of their habits change, that their whole life is reorganized only by the power of that fire of change and purification? which comes from God. It's no wonder that God is surrounded by a storm and a purifying fire because things change. And the old stuff is burned away. And in fact, everything is new. It's a remarkable thing. It's something that is so incredibly impressive. And I was particularly impressed to see that sudden change occur that that doctor had talked about that that doctor had talked about. So we see vitality and power, and we have actually seen that, that power to change and purify, not so much in fire and the transfiguration, but we see the power of God and how it changes everything in the transfiguration. And it's kind of a mystery, you know, but it does impress us with the power of God. So after six days then, if we read the scripture, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up the high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone could bleach them, and there appeared before him Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter, of course, didn't know what to do. The disciples didn't know what to do. They were, they were kind of confused by this, by this change. And Peter, of course, just blurt something out. Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. And it says so. He, he, it says he did not know what to say. They were so frightened, so he just blurted something out. Very typical of Peter. And a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Sometimes in the transfiguration, <clears throat> we kind of forget about uh, the change that has to occur because we're so blinded by the brightness <clears throat> of Jesus and those who accompanied them, uh, those who accompanied him, that we kind of forget <clears throat> the whole point of the thing is to show the power of God and who we should, and, and, and that we should listen to Jesus. That we should listen to Jesus. It focuses our attention on the power of God, and then God says, be quiet, listen to what Jesus has to say. Jesus is the one who's going to kindle that fire within you, and... Uh, Jesus is the one who's going to change the way you look at things. <clears throat> that fire, you've seen the power, that fire is going to spread in unexpected ways, and that power lets you know that that fire is unstoppable and unquenchable, and it's going to spread all over the world. That's what we can get excited about. You're the keepers of that flame. You're the keepers of change in our society. Sometimes I hear commentators on the radio say, you know, that we need to have more of a spirit of love, that we need to have more of a spirit of servility, and that sort of thing in our society. And I think a lot of people agree we need to have a better work ethic. We need to have all sorts of things. Well, that flame, that the power of God... Is found, with, is found in that flame that you spread around, that's the answer. That's the answer. I have to tell you that years ago, 
the Sunday school was considered to be one of the foundations of the nation's moral fiber and also a foundation of providing children with the habits that would make them into good citizens. It was the Sunday school of the church. And their children learned to love Jesus, and it was a foundation for their whole life, a flame that, that, that would keep them their whole life, a flame of belief. Yes, it served that central role within the United States when religion was acknowledged, you know, acknowledged more fully, and when you went from one town to another, maybe to follow a job, you looked for a church. And many people will send their children to Sunday school now who don't attend church primarily for that reason, <clears throat> because it's a foundation. And as it turns out, <clears throat> That foundation in the past helped to sustain our nation with a spirit of love, a spirit of cooperation, a spirit of civility, that sort of thing. It is actually kindled by human needs, and those needs are still there. You are the agents of change in our society. You're the one who speaks to those needs, each and every one of you. Those needs for acceptance, those needs for love, those needs for being given respect, those needs to rise above and perhaps meet a higher moral level than we would otherwise meet the need that we have to give to others and not just seek after our own interest, the need for service, all of those things are kindling for that fire. All we need to do is find ways to reach out with the flame that's in our heart and touch the kindling in the hearts of others. And in the modern world, we may need to find new ways in which to do that, but we need to do that. If you can think of anybody who has something in their lives now where they need a sense of love, a sense of acceptance, all sorts of things like that, and there are many people in our society who do, that, who do need that now, then possibly it might be possible to reach out to them and say, why don't you come to church? Um, give them a time. And we meet at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'll, I'll be planning on seeing you there. That's the way, to, that's the way you do it. Uh, basically, um, just be kind of directive. I'll be planning on seeing you there. Because you're helping. You're, you're, you're starting to get this person uh, some, some help in relation to this fire which can burn within them by which the power of God can change things for them. I've often heard people who are successful talk about that. And they say, one of the things that really made a big difference in my life is that I was given a sense of purpose. That sense of purpose made a big difference in their lives. So, as we move forward then into Lent, the whole point of Jesus' sacrifice, the whole point of Jesus' sacrifice is that we tell good news to the whole world, that death has no sting anymore, that the things would, that would alienate us, the things that would keep us from being everything we could be, have no power. And all we need to do is touch the flame of belief to the kindling, the needs that are within us. And God's power will change us. Amen. You have been listening to St. Paul United Church of Christ, 2030 Plank Road, Keokuk. Join our worship service at 10 a.m. with fellowship hour immediately following. Until next week, may God bless.